Let us remain standing just a moment for a word of prayer while we bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, as we're approaching Thee tonight, Lord, in this time of fellowship, we thank Thee for the blood of Jesus Christ and for this time of fellowship. Now, laying before me is some handkerchiefs that's been sent in here, Lord, to the convention. It represents people who are needy. And we're told in the Bible that they took from the body of St. Paul handkerchiefs and aprons, and unclean spirits went away from them, and the sick was healed. We realize that we're not St. Paul, but you're still the same God, and you have provided a way today, for you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We pray that you heal these people. And may, as one writer said, that when Israel was blocked off by the Dead Sea from the Promised Land, that God looked down through the pillar of fire with angry eyes, and the sea got scared and rolled back, and Israel went on the journey. God, I pray that when these handkerchiefs are laid up on the body of the sick, may God look not only through the pillar of fire, but through the blood of His own Son, who may, and may the sickness move back and give place for the healing power of Christ. Bless this convention, Lord, and it's finishing up tonight. We pray that you'll just visit us in a great way as you have been doing and give us of thy blessings. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Be seated. The Lord bless. <clears throat> I was so stirred by the, the compliment just paid me by Brother Carlson. I would like to take uh, time to say a few things about that, but I know that you've been today and all through the convention. There's been many preaching and much preaching of great preachers that have spoke to you, and I, I appreciate them all. And I know you're tired now, and you'll be going home after a while, and maybe to your churches tomorrow, and I, I won't take much of your time. But as Brother Carlson, just such a, a noble statement. Last night when I left here, I put my arms around Joseph. I said, what's the matter with me? I asked my wife the other day, am I a madman? I can't help from saying those things. There's an impulse within me that drives it. I, I can't help that. If something is... I look around and upon the church... This afternoon in the motel I'm staying in, there's a bunch of people come in drunk, and women, and grandmothers, and wearing shorts and dressed immorally and drinking and smoking. And, uh, and I thought, God, why should I speak to my sisters in the way that I do, and not wanting to say those things, but why should I do that? And look to here, and just as sweetly, not an audible voice, but something inside said, I don't want my children looking like that. There you are. See. You are different people. When I seen him say, heard it in my heart, don't want my children. <laughs> that done me good. My children. I love the church. That's what Christ died for, the church. And I believe in the church. But some of the things that goes on in the church, when you constantly preach against it and lay the word out to it, and then see the church still grow up on in that, it's the Honestly, I know I'm called everything from an archangel to a devil. I'm your brother. I'm your brother. And those things might be said about me. I can't help what's said. I must be honest. I want to say as Paul, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision that came to me as a boy. And since then, the Lord has worked having confidence in God, faith in Christ. Here, a few weeks ago, last time I was in Chicago, rather, I was having the businessman who made a little panoramic with different ministers around the city. And then I was to speak the, the uh, off show, the, uh, the last part of it, and, uh, at a ministerial rally. And I was getting ready for a great uh, spiritual gastronomical jubilee, I guess I would call it. And... Uh, one night, about three or four nights before the happened, I was in the hotel room, 
The lightning was flashing. There was a storm on it. Just come from the meeting. It was about one o'clock in the morning. And he said, go to the window. There was that light shining in the room that you've got the picture of and know about. He said, move over to the window and stand by that third place. And I stood there. I looked out across. And he said, they got a trap set for you. But don't you worry. I'll be with you. Tell Mr. Carlson here. And another man will be with him, which will be Tommy Hicks. They'll not get that auditorium they're planning on. It'll be at another place, the brown room. And when they come in, there'll be a colored man set to your left, and then he'll show me where everybody be sitting. So now tell that you'll meet Mr. Carlson tomorrow for breakfast. Here he sits. And in the room, the Holy Spirit described every bit of it. And that meeting where they're going to have it was canceled. They had to take another room. And when they all come in, every person set right to their place. There's Brother Carlson. He never says anything but what it's right. Right. Perfectly right. right. And I said to the ministerial association, I know what you have against me. It's about my teaching about Christ. Now, I heard you introduce yourself as doctor so-and-so and and doctor so-and-so. I have not even a grammar school education. But I want some of you all that says the teaching's wrong, it's a doctor, to get your Bible and come here and stand by me before these ministers. Or keep off my back from now on. That's right. Uh, If it's a meal ticket to you, and don't try to discuss it with me. I have one thing that's to please Christ and His Word. And that's my purpose in life. And friends, it's not easy when you love people and yet you just have to cut them to pieces. You don't mean to do that. But how can a man that's going to preach for inspiration say anything but what inspiration comes? If I ever say anything's contrary to the Word, then you call my attention. Of course, many times among the people out when I'm in of circles of conventions. I speak not nothing but just a great fundamental evangelical doctrine. Sometimes I try to speak against sin and the rebuking of such things that see people doing and trying to live like the world and still pretend to be a Christian. It's the greatest stumbling block the church ever had. It's such as that. We ought to either be in or be out. We are. But not pretend something when we're not. And so it, it makes it very hard. Some time ago a friend just wrote me a letter. There's a person standing there but this friend said, uh, Brother Branham is a prophet when he's under the anointing, but said, don't listen to his teaching. It's wrong. Now, could you imagine a person say that? A prophet? Well, that's who the word of the Lord come to. They ha- there's only one that had the interpretation of the word. I'm not a prophet. I don't claim to be any prophet. But I say, if, if any person that wouldn't admit that the word of God is right, regardless of how we have to cut ourselves, we can't cut our... Or we got to cut ourselves to match God's word. We can't cut our, our God's word to match what we think. We got to keep in the word. And someone come not long ago said, this doctrine, this thing that you believe, said, if the angel of the Lord told you that, we'll believe it. A group of ministers. I said, the angel of the Lord, if he said anything different, I wouldn't believe him. How can you base yourself up on an experience or some a sensation? The devil can't impersonate any sensation you can, you can crop up. I've seen all this stuff. I've seen people, I've seen heathens dance in the Spirit, speak in tongues, and drink blood out of a human skull and call them the devil. I've seen people shout and go in Mohammed's and run splinters through their fingers till they couldn't even feel it, take a lance and run up through their face like that. Shouting, screaming, praising their God. You call that God? I've seen them run fish hooks through them, balls of water hang like that, and walk through far 15 feet deep and four foot across like that, back and forth, not be a scorch of fire on them. Not even a smell of burn. Do you call that God? Certainly not. God is a Word. In the beginning was a Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word still God. How do we go to judge? My old mother going to heaven up on go. She said, Billy, you've been my support in spiritual things. I, and you've taken care of me. See, they didn't go hungry. I said, Mother, we are a Catholic background. We know that, being Irish. I said, when I was a young man and had felt the call of God, we didn't go to no church, none of us. Never was in a church in my life, I guess, till I was a man. And I said, well, I went over to the Catholic church, and they said, we are the church. I go down to the Lutheran, and they say, we are the church. Or to the Baptist, we are the church. Well, which one is the church? There's 900 and something of them. No one can base the faith on that. No one can base the faith upon a sensation. There's only one is right. And that's God's word. Amen. Heavens and earth will pass away, but my word shall not. Eve just misinterpreted, or Satan did too. Eve just one little 
fraction of God's Word. Just a little bitty thing, and it's caused all this trouble. Is that right? Every death, every, uh, every baby, every waterhead baby, every crippled man, every, every death, every graveyard and everything was by one person just misbelieving God's Word in one little twist. And if God wouldn't let it get by then, how much more now? We're going to come to the Word, or we won't come at all. That's right. So you can imagine loving people, lovely people, and how it takes to stand up there and not think of what you're going to say and see the Spirit blast those things out. But yet, the comfort of Him being with you, to see Him come, show things. I can take anybody that thinks, I was a fortune teller, Sue Sarah. Do you know that's the very reason they put Jesus to death? Amen. The very thing, because He perceived their thoughts and so forth. If I'd read the thoughts here last night, I'd have, I'd have had a, such a... If the Holy Spirit would have permitted me to speak last night of such things that was going on, I, you'd have thrown me out of the country. People pat you on back and say, Brother, and thank you, you're a fortune teller. Amen. Don't you think I know that? I can't have the Spirit of God without knowing it. Amen. He that believeth in me the works that I do shall he do also. More than this shall he go to. I go to my Father. See what I mean? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, let the Holy Spirit now speak to us in these next few words. God, I pray that there will not be one missing at the day of the judgment, that we'll all be there and all be covered with the blood of the Son of God. Forgive us of our trespasses. We hear you say one time, when you teach us to pray, and you come to the spot, forgive us our trespasses debts as we forgive our debtors. Then you stopped and said, if you from your heart don't forgive every man his trespass, neither does your heavenly Father forgive you. So we see the place we're in. God, I hope to live to see the day that I can see the church of the living God all lined up as one great army of Christ, all covered by the blood, every sister and brother a saint, marching forward in the power of the Word of God. You said you would restore all that the canker worms and locusts and caterpillars that eat up. I believe you will do it, Lord. I'm holding forth that you do it, and I hope to see it in my age. If not, I'll sow the seed of your Word, and then when the Holy Spirit falls, it'll, we know the righteous, the rain falls on righteous and unrighteous. The same rain that waters the wheat waters the weed. But Father God, let us in our lifetime sow nothing but the genuine seed of God. Therefore, when the Spirit comes and falls upon it, may it bring forth a reproduction of Jesus Christ, being a son or daughter of Christ. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. God richly bless you all. My blessings with you, my peace upon you, and I don't I hope and trust that Someday, you know, more, if no more in this land, in that land it is to come, when we're called to face Christ, that the trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ shall rise, that together one great unit will go to meet him. I want to speak just for, uh, i got a watch here that I can set and make it exactly 30 minutes, and, and that'll be just exactly 10 o'clock. And uh, God willing, I'll get through right then, just for a moment of your time, if you'll spare it just a little bit. Now, tomorrow afternoon... To you people out of Chicago, bring out your sick and afflicted. Tomorrow afternoon at the Mather is, is going to be healing service. That's all right, Brother Carlson. I asked Brother Joseph if it would be all right. He said he was sure it would be. So that's all right. And then Monday is the missionary rally for Brother Joseph, this kind little fellow that we all love. Just speaking to a brother here that I believe he take me over to Brother Egri that time. Egri, when I got such a sharp letter from him and the Lord gave us that great word and I think maybe 40 or more received the Holy Ghost out there at a Lutheran college. <laughs> Could you imagine that? But when he come to, he thought it was a soothsayer or polished up something. But when he was honest enough to sit down by the Word of God, then it come to him. And that made a difference. Now, I'm going to read out of St. John, the first chapter of, not St. John, pardon me, of 1 John, first chapter 1, 7. So I'll read this first. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us 
from all sin. I want to speak just a moment on the thought of fellowship. And this being a convention, we all know that a convention is a fellowship time. And we have, I like fellowship. I love to come to a fellowship meeting where we can have fellowship. And if you'll excuse me after reading my text that I, I make a remark to a, a brother sitting here, Brother Tommy Nichols, I'm so glad when you printed that article or, or in the, your, the businessman's voice about the vision of going to heaven, you put it just exactly the way it was. Thank you, Brother Tommy. God bless you for that. Now, on the fellowship, on the fellowship, everyone wants it. Tonight, there at the motel, they were having fellowship. What was it? Around drinking. They were having, they went and got some more bottles and beer across at the taverns. And here they all was, grandmothers, grandfathers, drinking and carrying on the most immoral things. To I uh, had to, in the hot room, had to pull down the windows and shut it up uh, to keep from hearing the loud carrying on. And looks to me like if we live in a Christian nation, that ought not be permitted even. But i tell you one thing. You start screaming and shouting and watch how long that lasts. And there'll be something said about that right quick. Yet we're in a Christian America. I stopped in a room. I went today to eat dinner at a little place. If I ever come here again, I'm going to eat dinner over here if I can get in and get me a room somewhere. I went to eat dinner in a little place. And honest, they had that old boogly woogly, you know, rocker roller. Uh, I'm a missionary. I come... I've been in, way into the hot and tops and down in the jungles of Africa. I heard that back there, but I never would have thought I'd heard it in America. And there it was, carrying on. And all the carrying on, I just got sick. And Billy and I got up and walked away and went to another place. And, and uh, they didn't have any in there. I said, look in. If they got one of them little old jute boxes, we're not going in. Uh, just leave it alone. I took my family and one, one time traveling. They had a plane. I walked over. I said, mister, I'm a missionary. And I need every penny that I got. But I got my family. Me and we're all hungry. We've been about three hours trying to find a place to eat. I'll give you a $5 bill if you'll pull that plug out of there until I get through eating. <laughs> Made him so ashamed of himself to so just keep your $5 if you've got that much courage. He said, just let it alone. <laughs> so that's it. Oh, Christian America, of course. Yes, Christian America. we tried everything. They have fellowship around them kind of things. Crows have fellowship on a dead carcass. But doves eat doves' food. <laughs> they have fellowship in the wheat field. And so it depends on what, you're, what you are. A dove can't not, he cannot fellowship with the crows and vultures because he has no gall. There's no bitterness about him. He couldn't eat it. It would kill him. And a Christian can't fellowship around like that. It would kill the very spirit that was in him. Read the Holy Spirit and it'd go away. Now, we're trying to get fellowship with the nations. We're spending billions of dollars giving it to foreign nations to make fellowship, and communism is spreading all over the country just the same. See? You're not long ago. Why, well, we had a war, and some of the stuff was shot back at us and made in USA. See, trying to send them over stuff and things like that and fire it back at us. You can't get fellowship like that. You just can't do it. Now, we have tried then to educate people to fellowship. There's no way to educate people to fellowship. You get farther away all the time. The church lost its birthrights when it adopted education instead of salvation to try to bring people to a knowledge of Christ. They tried to denominate to fellowship. You cannot do it because you draw a boundary line cut the other fellow out. You cannot do it. There's no way to, to fellowship and denominationals. You'll never be able to do it because each denomination, this World Council of Churches, why they're fighting at their own selves or cutting their throat. How can they ever get fellowship when people in there don't even believe in God? Infidels and everything else. How can you... Jesus said, how can two walk together except they be agreed? Amen. How can you do it? There's only one way you can walk with another man. That's when you're agreed with him. So how are you going to cut off in denominations and so forth and make an agreement when one separates himself from the other? And yet God wants us to fellowship. There's something in it to make fellowship. Man's always wanted to do it, but he's always tried to achieve by his own knowledge how to bring it, and he'll never be able to do it. There's only one place of genuine fellowship, and that's under the shed blood of the innocent. Amen. That's the only way we can have it. 
We'd have fellowship if every church would be a Lutheran, if every church would be a Baptist, or so forth. We'd have fellowship under the denominational rights, but we who read the Bible know that these things makes us disagree. Now, the only thing we can have fellowship under is like we sit here tonight, Methodist, Baptist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, or whatever more, when we're under the shed blood of the innocent. That was God's requirement, and God never does change His program. When God once makes a decision, He has to forever remain with that decision. Now, He's infinite. We're, we are not infinite. We are, we are mortal beings. So therefore, we are finite. So we cannot be, uh, be infinite. So then, we make promises. You make promises. You have to break them. You do something today and tomorrow you know no more about it. So you can do it better tomorrow. Next year, you can still do it better than you did that day because you learn more about it. Because we are finite, bound to, to these little three dimensions that we live in. But God is infinite. Therefore, God can speak once and His decision is perfect and it can never change. That's the reason my faith is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. All around my soul gives way that He's all my hope and faith. For on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other grounds is sinking sand. Amen. And Christ is the Word. Amen. He is the Word. Up on he said that heavens and earth would pass away, but my word shall never pass away. Not one word of it can fail because it's God's word. You cannot, in the last book of the Revelation, it said, whosoever shall take one word out of this or add one word to it, the same will be taken out of his part from the book of life. Therefore, any creed, anything else that would add anything to the word of God or take anything out of it, it's death to do so. Like it was to Eve in the beginning. It's a death penalty to take our ad. Just take it the way it says. The Bible says it's of no private interpretation. It's already interpreted. Just read it and believe it. God watches over His Word to keep it. Therefore, it's His Word what we have to stand on. Now, the only place, therefore, believing His Word, the only place under the shed blood is a place for fellowship where everybody can rally around and feel the same. Because it's under one place of the shed blood. Now, to place your faith upon anything else besides the Word of God is sinking sand. No matter what it is, it's still sinking sand. It's got to be the Word. That is true. We believe that. That's the reason I have faith to believe that everything that God promised. Now, I say God can do things that's not written in the Word. That's true. But as long, I'd have to wonder about that. But as long as he gives me what he promised here, I'll be satisfied with just what he promised. Then I'm positive to be right. Stay with his word. His word cannot change. Or if he can change, then God can change. If the word can change. If the word needs altered, then God is not God. If God met a man and upon the basis of his faith under the shed blood save the first man, Adam, he has to forever remain under the same program. Amen. If he didn't, he'd done something wrong when he made his first decision. If God saved a man, and the only way that he saved him was by the shed blood of an innocent lamb, if that was the basis God decided to save man by, anything, if he ever changes it to somebody's creed or a church or some dogma, then God made the wrong decision in the Garden of Eden. For the first man he ever saved, he saved him on the basis of his faith in the shed blood of an innocent lamb. That was the only place that he could come. God chose a place called Adam and Eve and shed the blood of an innocent one and covered them with the substance of this innocent one, with the blood upon them. That was the basis that man could talk to God and hear his word and get his word was under the shed blood. And the only way that man, our churches, our peoples will ever know the real truth about God is come under the shed blood of the innocent one into his presence. Then the spirit that comes upon you will testify that this word is right, every word of it. And it don't need correction nowhere. Right? It, it has to remain that way. Because he's God and his decision has to be perfect and forever perfect. 
Let's run the thing just for a few moments. The first thing you know, my 30 minutes will be up and I won't be started. Now, under this shed blood, now we realize that the oldest book in the Bible is Job. The oldest written book. It was wrote before Moses wrote Genesis. It says written before Moses wrote Genesis, rather. Now, notice, Job, righteous man, godly man, everything against him one day. Satan took an ocean to make him deny God. And when he did, Job, I love to read Job. Many people say it's a riddle. It isn't. It's the word of God. Yes. Jesus referred to Job about, have you not heard the patience? No matter what was going on, how much he was persecuted, how much he was called that he was in the wrong path, Job stayed pat on the word. I like that. He said, for venture my children have sinned. I'll offer a sacrifice for them. Now the only thing the man knew was the burnt offering. That was God's requirement. And many people think sometimes because disaster happens to a Christian, oh, he got off the will of God. They left the church. They went out. Sometimes that's not right. Because God chastens every son that comes to him. He cleanses him and purges him and tries him to see if he'll stand. That's what he was doing in the time of Job. I preached on Job one time for about six months when I pastored. There's a lady who had the honesty enough. I got him up to that ash heap sitting out there, you know, all full of boils and a piece of crop uh, combing off his boils. And the lady said, Brother Bam, are you ever going to get Job off that ash heap? Yeah. <laughs> uh, about three Sundays, but I was building around to make it. There he was. He was a prophet. He was God's anointed. And the only thing the man knew to do was stay with the word. That's all. They come and they said, Job, you know you've done wrong. Look what's happened to you. Everybody's turned their back upon you. And here your friends are gone. And all and the only thing you can do is sit out here and look at your miserable looking wretch. Good boils and everything broke out on you. And look at your condition. But Job said he had not sinned because he is coming God's appointed way under the shed blood. Amen. Then God's obligated to a man who will stand like that. Yes. He let him go right down to the last person, even to his wife. Come out and said, Job, why not you curse God and die? Just think his own wife turned against him. And because someone would turn against us. And think that we're funny and odd. All God's people are funny and odd to the world. Sure they are. You are peculiar people, a royal priesthood, offering sacrifices to God, the fruits of your lips, giving praise to His name. Now, we notice that even Job's wife turned against him. Turned her back on him and said, Why don't you curse God and die? In other words, you look miserable. Why don't you just curse God and I said, Thou speakest like a foolish woman. I never called her foolish. She said she talked like one. She never said she was foolish. That's her, let me I correct this. Uh, sometimes when I'm calling down you sisters, I'm not saying you're worldly, but sometimes you look like it. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I don't say you do wrong, but sometimes you dress yourself like, like it looks like it, you see. So... Uh, Job told his wife, I won't get on that. Job told his wife, said, Thou speakest like a foolish woman. And after a while, oh, God's always faithful when we're coming God's provided way. Job said, I've made my confession. I have burnt the offering. That's exactly what God required. He worshiped God under the shed blood. And all of a sudden, then the Spirit come upon the prophet. And the thunders roared and the lightnings flashed. And he said, I know my Redeemer liveth. Amen. And the last days, though if the skin worms destroys this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God whom I shall see for myself. See? Under the blood. There set the rest of them as far away as anything. But Job, staying under the blood with the word. That's it. Under the blood with the word. No matter how dark it gets, just keep going on. Hold to God's unchanging word. Amen. Go right down. If you hold the word, you got his hand. Amen. Go on down. And then him being a prophet, 
the lightning's flash, and he saw the vision of the coming of God. He knew that his skin worms would destroy his body, but he said, Yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself. Mine eyes shall behold, and not another, for we brought nothing into this world. It's certain we take nothing out. The Lord gave the Lord, taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He stayed on that shed blood and the word, the promise. He was spiritual. He was a prophet. Looked like God turned his back on him, but just to try and see if he would stay with the word. We're all trying. Every Christian... Every son, every child that comes to God is tried by the Word. See if you'll be loyal to it. When the showdown comes, what decision are you going to make? That's it. And he that cannot stand chastisement but goes on with the world, he is a illegitimate child and not a son or daughter of God. Certainly not. Now that the spiritual minded catches the Word, lines up with it, and the Spirit comes down under the shed blood and takes that person. Israel had one meeting place for fellowship. Only one place that Israel could meet God. That was under the shed blood. Amen. No other place did God meet them uh, under the shed blood. Now, we get over into Numbers, the 19th chapter, for a moment, just to quote it. Won't have time to read it, but just to quote it. We find out in Numbers... 19, we find this, that God told the children of Israel on their journey, said, get me a red heifer upon which has never come a yoke. That is what? That means something. If we had time, we could go into those symbols. A red heifer. She must be red, not a spot on her. Red. Red's a bad color in one sense of the word. But red is the color of atonement. Did you ever know scientifically red through red looks white? Right. Red through red, looking at red through red, it looks white. Though your sins be red like crimson. But when God looks through them through the, the shed blood of His Son, you're as white as snow. Red through red. No other color does it. Red through red looks white. And that's the way God looks at you. Though you, no matter what you are, if you come under the shed blood, God don't see you, but He looks through the blood, and though your sins be so many, yet you look as white as a lily to Him. Red heifer with no spots on her. She must never have a yoke upon her neck. I could blast that to pieces right now. She isn't yoked up with anything. That's right. No unbelieving organization. She stays free. Then... She was to be what? The sacrifice. Then she was to be burnt, killed in the evening time. Uh, not in the morning, in the evening. And then she was to be burnt. And her ashes was to be kept aside for the waters of separation. Oh, what a beautiful scene this is. We just could get into it. How the waters, or ashes, was to be put with, made waters of separation. Therefore, then they were to take her blood and make seven stripes over the door where you enter into the congregation, out of the court, into the congregation, into the holy place. And then the Spirit was in the holy of holies. Notice. Now, what a beautiful picture here. I hope these next five or six minutes you can catch it. Notice the holiest of holy and the way of approach made for the unclean person. They had certain processes they must come through. The first, the unclean must come to the outer court and there be sprinkled with the waters of separation. What is the waters of separation? The Bible tells us that we are washed by the Water of the word of separation. Therefore, the word separates us from our unbelief. Amen. How could a creed do it? It's the word. Yes. The word separates us. It's the thing that lets us know that we are wrong. Amen. If you went to the church and said, it's all right to do this, and went over here and said, over here and do this, come to the word. Yes. The word's what separates us. 
And I notice another thing. I hope you forgive me if I run over this time. Notice another thing. It's just too good to let go. The one that sprinkled this water separations must have clean hands. And it must be kept in a clean place. The waters of separation cannot stay in a vile place. It must be kept in a clean place. Out of courts, what is it? The sinner who comes and hears the word and builds up faith in him and it's God. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing the word of God. Amen. Now what are we trying to do? Get into fellowship. Now the man heard the word. He believed the word and he was sprinkled in with the water of separation. Yet he wasn't in fellowship. No, sir. Uh, you fundamentalists, I want you to look at this. He still was not in fellowship. Remember, when Israel come up from Egypt, Moab met him and wouldn't let him have a revival in his land. There's no cooperation. <laughs> and Moab believed the same God that Israel believed in. They went and got their bishop up there. Balak brought him down there and he was just as fundamental as Israel was. Israel, that wander, no place to go. This great organized nation here together brought their celebrity out to curse that bunch of renegades, they said, coming up there. Amen. They forgot that this bunch of people that had no place to go but were wanderers and pilgrims and strangers. They failed to see that pillar of fire going before them. Amen. They failed to see that brass serpent and that smitten rock following them. Although they had done wrong. Balaam thought, surely, me being a fundamentalist, I'll sure do it. And he built seven altars. That's what God required. Perfect number. He put seven clean bullocks, just exactly what Israel had. Seven altars of what Israel had. Seven candlesticks and so forth. The perfect number. And here was this bishop done the very same thing. Seven clean sacrifices. And also seven rams. Speaking of the faith that a the Son of God, the Lamb of God was coming. Amen. Talk about fundamentally, just as fundamental as Israel was, but he didn't have the Spirit. Amen. He was in fellowship with God. If that be so, God got the answer to the fundamentalism, then he certainly refused the wrong person. He had to accept Moab, and he had to accept Israel too. If God only takes worship, a church, an altar, Cain was just as fundamental as Abel was. Cain built an altar. Cain made a sacrifice. Cain worshiped. An altar, church joining, sacrifice, creed, and all these things, if that's all God requires, he was wrong when he condemned Cain because Cain comes that matter on the same ground that Abel did. Exactly right. Well, what was it? By revelation. By revelation. Not by education, but by revelation. Abel saw that it wasn't bananas or apples that Eve eat, and he offered blood. And God accepted it. It was revealed to him. That's the reason Jesus said himself. When he come off the Mount Transfiguration, he said, Who do you say I am? One said Moses, Elijah, and so forth. The supernatural stir such things. But Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The and he said, Blessed art thou, Simon, the son of Jonas. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. You never learned it in a seminary. It wasn't just word altogether. But my Father, which is in heaven, has revealed this to you. Now the Catholic Church said it was Peter they built the church up on. The Protestants said it was on Christ. To my way of sin, it was neither one. It was up on the revelation of the word. For he said, Thou art Peter. And flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father which is in heaven has revealed it to you, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell can't prevail against it. It'll show that the whole gate of hell will be against it, but it'll never prevail. The world will move right on just the same. Upon this rock I build my church, show that everything would be against it, but it cannot prevail. It'll move right on just the same. Now, Waters of separation, separating us, letting us recognize 
that we are sinners, that we're trespassers. That's the reason I can hammer the thing. That's the reason any minister ought to stand against anything that God says is wrong to do. Be spirit-filled, he will, for it comes from heaven. See, against the wrong. Mustn't do that. That's the waters of separation. Still, that wasn't enough. He understood that was his knowledge, his mind, the womb of his mind, the battlegrounds where the battles are fought in the mind. Then he cast it aside. He accepted that it is God's provided way. Is he ready for fellowship now? No, no. That was Luther's message. Along came, he's going, he's headed in the right way now. Which way is he going? Towards the congregation. Here he is separated here by the waters, washing of the water of the word. He's separated from his sin. Now he turns. Then he has to recognize the seven stripes, which we had time to go into that. <laughs> seven church ages, seven candlesticks, the same. Every, every age, every church, everything else has to recognize it's the blood. Every believer, he's still is not in fellowship. The congregation's inside worshiping. But he's out there making himself ready. He still argued the nomination and organization and everything else. But when he comes under the blood, what does he do when he looks at that blood? It recognizes, make him recognize that something died and shed its blood and went before him Amen. to make a way for fellowship. Then... He sees the blood stripes on the door. He recognizes after he knows the word of God. Then he comes to recognize the shed blood. And he has to come beneath the shed blood. Like Israel and Egypt and so forth. He comes beneath the blood. Then after he recognized himself. And Hebrews 13, 12 and 13 said, Jesus, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gates. Amen. He was our sacrifice. Every ailment that comes from his body constitutes the new birth. Listen, sisters, I'm your brother, and I hope you understand me. When a baby's born, what is the natural procedure of the natural birth? The first thing, if it's a normal birth, is water. Next is blood. Then is life. Coming from the body of Jesus Christ, they stabbed his side. Water. Blood. And into the hands, I command my spirit. Amen. There were three elements come from his blood. Justification, sanctification, the baptism of the Holy Spirit that brings you through the blood into the fellowship. Then when this man, separated by the word, sanctified by the blood, walks into divine fellowship, then he's in the congregation of the people where the power of God is a falling and the fellowship, they don't care what this, that, other, they're all under one place and one accord. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleansing us from all our righteousness. Then we have fellowship one with the other. Amen. Oh, how would we could hang on that for a while. Yes, sir. But here's the reason. That's the reason I like these businessmen's conventions. Somebody made a noise not long ago that the businessman was going to make a join up with some organization. I said, when they do, I hand in my fellowship card. That kills it right there. It does every time. Certainly does. Yes, sir. No, sir. I'm with them because they're standing for the very thing that I believe in. I don't care if you're Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, whatever you are. When you come beneath that blood, brother, we have fellowship one with another. And every man looks the same. When Jesus taught that famous parable and talked about the wedding supper, he found one man there without a wedding garment on. You know the customs of the Orient. I've been there and I know what. They give out the invitations. And every man has an invitation comes. Whether he's poor, whether he's rich, whether he can dress good or not, there's a man stands at the door and the bridegroom and gives him a robe. When he comes in, right. he's dressed with a robe. I don't care if he's ragged, whatever he is, he puts on the robe and every one of them look the same. Because they're under the robe and they can't get a robe without the invitation. And this man has slipped in some other way. He couldn't have fellowship for he wasn't dressed right. And when a man lets his creed or his denomination separate him from his brother, something's wrong. He slipped in with some denominational gate or something like that. And the Bible says, bind him and throw him in the outer darkness where there be weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth. Brother, it ain't creeds that takes us in. It ain't creeds that brings our fellowship. It, education takes us farther away from it than anything else I know of. God 
It wasn't an educational program. It was a program of the death of His Son. Death, burial, and resurrection, the shedding of the blood, and through that, under that blood, we all have fellowship one with another while the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. What is sin? Unbelief. Amen. There's no body in that fellowship or worship will disagree with any word God ever spoke. Why? The very sacrifice that died for him is the one that wrote the word. In the Old Testament, when a believer come up to worship, he had done something wrong, he could not, unless he come by the blood. What did he do? He brought his lamb, walked up to the priest, the priest examined the lamb, said it was a good lamb, perfect. Then he laid his hands up on the lamb and confessed his sins. Then the sins was transferred from him to the lamb. The lamb must die because he's not a sinner anymore, but the lamb. They cut its throat. The blood run out. It's sprinkled upon them. Burn on the fire. All right. Notice. Now, that would be good enough. But why? Why didn't that work? It was showing you there's coming something greater. Because the blood of a goat or a sheep could not uh, atone for a sin. It could cover it but couldn't divorce it. Why? The spirit, that's the life that's in the blood cell, in the chemistry of the blood, and the life in the blood cell was a sheep's life. And that sheep that died, that sheep's life could not come back upon the worshiper. Therefore, it couldn't work. But when we come to Calvary, by faith, lay our hands upon the Lamb of God, and His blood cell was broke, which was not neither Jew nor Gentile. He was God. And we own that unadulterated blood, not by sex, but by a creative act of Jehovah Himself, who created the blood cell in the womb of the virgin and brought forth the Son of God. He was not no son of Mary. No call you Catholics, call him the uh, mother of God. Calling her mother of God. He didn't even call her mother one time. He called her woman. That's what she was. She was the incubator that God used. Just exactly like he'd use any other person. She was no mother of God. God has no mother. He was God alone. In him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And we lay our hands upon there and confess that he is our Savior and our God. And when we lay our hands upon him by faith and the blood that was shed there on Calvary, we are brought into the fellowship. And the Holy Spirit that was in that blood cell returns back to the believer, making him a son or a daughter of God. Then we have fellowship. And if the Holy Ghost wrote the Bible, how can the Holy Ghost under the blood that you've accepted ever come back and deny the word? Amen. Amen. There's the fellowship oh, under the blood. Amen. Amen. That's as clean as I know the gospel, brethren. That's the only salvation I know of. That's the only where my faith is built right there. That by Jesus Christ, Emmanuel veins where sinners plunge beneath the blood lose all their guilty stains. And when we come into that underneath that blood, and recognize ourselves sinners and come out on the other side and he seals our belief like that by his Holy Spirit the same Holy Spirit that wrote the Bible and put every word into it how can that Holy Spirit turn around and deny that word? How can they accept the creed instead of the word? How can they accept the dogma instead of the word? It cannot. The Holy Spirit will punctuate every word of God with Amen! Oh my, that's the fellowship I believe in. Then not only do you have fellowship with one another, we have fellowship with Christ. Why? We are reckon ourselves dead and buried and risen with Him in the resurrection and are sitting in heavenly places now in Christ Jesus. I read a little story not long ago in closing. There was an American boy, like a whole bunch of them, that went to Rome to study art, the great art galleries of Rome. He's ever there... Marvelous. How many have ever been in Rome? I guess many of you have. Was you out St. Angelo? Didn't that make you feel ashamed yourself? When I got off at St. Angelo, going a Catholic controlled place, there was a big sign in Rome where prostitution is. A, but a big sign there said to all American women, please put on some clothes and respect the dead. That's our Christian America. Rome has to say a thing like that. <laughs> all right. In this country of Rome, there was a young artist. And an old caretaker on the grounds noticed this young artist being different. All of them at night time to do like they do here. A certain big Bible college the other day was coming up going fishing and went down to a place for an afternoon fishing, come back up. I never heard such a noise in my life. Young girls out of this famous college and young boys, shorts on down there. Oh, mind talk you never heard. Let off the steam. I guess they thought that was the way to do it. What's the ministers that hatch out? 
What's the next generation going to be? If it's full of Rickies and Elvises now, what in the world would it be in another generation? What's it going to be? There you are. Oh, brother, that just something gets in me. I can't help it. Notice, this young man, he was different. The old caretaker followed him one day, every day. He'd go up towards the setting of the sun, up on the hill and watch the setting of the sun, rather. He'd look across the land, stand there with his hands like that. And the other kids would all get out at the days, services over and they'd drink and carry on, so and have mixed bathing and parties and everything, carry on. This young man, one day the old caretaker watched him each day. He got on his nerve. So one day he just followed him up, and he was, the young man was standing there looking across the sea towards this nation, towards the setting of the sun. The old caretaker said, pardon me, young man, I'd like to ask you a question. He said, yes, sir. What is it, sir? He said, now you've been here over a year. and said, I've watched you every day. You come up here about sundown when the services is over down there, your, your art uh, lessons, and said, you come here and watch the sun go down. He said, I, I'm just curious, old man. He said, I, I would just like to know why you do it. I just, I just want to know. Maybe I'm just curious. said, you forgive me if I'm wrong? said, for asking him? He said, no, no, sir. He said, in the first place, I'm a Christian. <laughs> the old caretaker said, and I am too. He said, that tells me why you don't go out on a party. Don't go out and act like the rest of them. Don't associate yourself with them. He said, I understand that now. You being a Christian, said, for I am too. He said, I'm looking for the consolation of the coming of the Lord. So we're standing there together. The young man reached over and put his arms around the old dad and hugged him up close to him. He said, are you married? He said, yes, I've raised a big bunch of children. He said, sir, the reason I watch that, I pray. He said, you know, way across the land in America, there's a certain state in that big United States. And in that state, there's a certain city. And in that certain city, there's a certain house. And in that house is a girl. She's a Christian too. And she said, as the sun coming here, it's in a different position there. But we made a vow that we'd watch as God moved the sun across. And said, I promised that I'd live true to her. She promised she'd live true to me through life. And said, someday I expect to go to her and make her my bride. So that's the reason I try to live the way I do, because I have made a promise, and I want to be true to my promise. Oh, if we today, as Christians, that's professing to be Christians, if we could separate ourselves from everything of the world, all our creeds and everything else, and stand towards, look towards heaven, separating ourselves from the things of the world, and live like Christians, because someday there's a certain place called heaven. <laughs> In my Father's house are many mansions. Someday, He's coming for us. Let's be true and faithful to that kind. And the only way we'll ever make it, friends, is when we are born again. And we cannot be born again until we come under the shed blood of Jesus Christ. In the closing of this convention, I would like to take this opportunity with you, friends, my friends, my brothers and sisters. I hope you let me be your brother and sister. I hope I can be to you as a, as a real friend. You sisters can be my sister. You brothers, my brother. Can I be your pastor? Can I be one of your fellow citizens of the kingdom of God worshiping with you? Let us take this opportunity and say this. What all we've heard today, my good friend, Brother David Duplissus, he said he's preached three or four hours today. Another brother that I know not, said a young fellow, preached this morning. Day after that, Brother Brown, a noted speaker, a great brother, has just come into the way. The great message that you've heard for those brethren, let's not just let it pass over us. Let's not do it. Let's walk under the blood of the Lord Jesus tonight. Let's dedicate ourselves to God afresh at the end of this uh, service tonight and say, Lord Jesus, take me, take me under your blood. And let me see only you, Lord. And let me worship you. Go back to the church you come from, to the denomination you come from. But remember, when you meet a brother or sister that's in another denomination, don't never separate yourself. He's your brother. That's your sister. You're all under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can't you do that? Would you like to dedicate your life anew tonight? I'd like to ask you. Last night, I love you for that. After a scorching heart, I got outside and wiped the tears from my eyes from having to say it. But I must be obedient to what was told me to say. I could only do it. Walked out. And even here where I presumed that 
about a great bunch of this people were Pentecostal people. But when the word came out of the morals and things of the church today, I said, how many of you recognize yourself wrong and would want to come into this fellowship of Christ? And about 95% of the congregation with enough real Christian conviction, with enough honesty in your heart to want to do right, raised up your hand right before your neighbor and wanted to be remembered in prayer. I got confidence in you. I believe that God will grant it. Now, it don't have to be any certain time, any set time. It can be this time when you're ready and willing to meet God on the basis of His Word and say, God, mold me and make me after your own fashion. If you'll do that tonight in a consecration service, just before we close, I believe God will meet every one of you. And if I never see you again this side of the river, I'll see you on the other side, believing in the same word with the same message that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And heavens and earth will pass away, but His word will never fail. Do you believe it? Will you, will you join with me in a consecration? I'll join, I want myself in a consecration to rededicate my life to the service of Almighty God. May I never give in. May I stay loyal and true and preach the word. Will you want, would you want to be that kind of a Christian? How many would like to be a real Christian? This will a full Christian. Raise up your hand. I'll just be honest. It's a real thing. God bless you. Let's stand to our feet. Oh, my God. This is the time. Now is the moment. Oh, I, I wish I knew what to say and could have said it if I knew what to say. You mean that? Jesus said, no man can come to me except my Father draws him first. And all the Father has given me will come to me. What made you stand to your feet? Did you really mean what we said? I'm ready to consecrate my life. Are you willing to die out to yourself and everything around you? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ is all you crave. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There you have fellowship with Christ, with God, with the angels, with the Holy Spirit, with all beings of heaven and all beings of earth because the whole body in heaven and earth is named after him. That's right. And you're one great big family. You'll have fellowship one with another. Let's raise our hands now to God. And with our song of consecration, I love you. Holy Spirit.
pull out. Just accept him in. Keep my soul, Lord. Now let's bow our hearts and heads just a moment. Make your dedication to God now. Quietly in your own way. Pray your prayer. And God, take me now. I'm standing in your presence. This convention's meant so much to me. Take me, oh God. Take the stone from my heart. Someday I got to go, Lord. It may be tonight. I don't know just when it'll be, but I I want to be in love with you, Lord Jesus. I want to be yours. My faith looks up to Just pray it as you think. Don't just halfway dedicate yourself. Just think now as you're going down. Take from me, Lord, all that's unlike you. Let me be your child from this time on. As you go farther, while life's dark made I tread and creep around me spread is out my God is dark. Turn today, O oh, I sorrows, fears away, nor let me ever stray from thee. Father, the sweetness of the Spirit, the sweetness of the music, be thou our guide, Lord, each one of us in our own separate way, knowing our weaknesses, Lord, and we confess them to thee, praying that you forgive us, O God. Take us into the potter's house tonight. Wash us in the blood of the Lord Jesus and mold us with that chemical in us, Lord, that when you look at us, it'll just be white. For we accept the blood of the Lord Jesus. We ask that you'll reveal yourself to us, Lord, in the Word. We know that this is your program, Father. This is your, this is your prophet. The Word is a prophet. It foretells 
anything contrary to it would be disobeying the prophet, the Bible. And we pray, Lord, that you'll break us up tonight, our stony hearts, our stony ways, and make us and mold us in the image of the Son of God by his own blood. So our fellowship can always be sweet and great. God grant that you bless this great uh, church that owns this ground that let us come here. This American Baptist Association that opened it up and let their doors come open that we could come in here as full gospel people. I pray, God, that there will be an old-fashioned revival break out among them. That the Holy Spirit will be poured out to every prayer tower and all down through these woods will be filled with saints singing and praising and shouting. Great signs and wonders come among them, Lord. They are our brothers. We pray for them. We pray for every church and every organization, every denomination, that they'll break down those fetters and cars and flee to the rock granite, Lord. The hour is close at hand now when we look for him to come, when we see the sleeping virgin begin to crave oil. Then when they went to buy it, the bridegroom come, that's thus saith the Lord. And Lord, we see it so close now. We pray, Lord, that you let us wake up real quick, have our lamps all trimmed and burning. The churches are beginning to realize that they've missed something. And we pray, Father, now that they're seeking for it, that we'll make ourselves ready. That's what you said. And while they were gone to buy oil, then the bridegroom comes. Help us, dear God. We consecrate our lives to you. And as I've asked my brothers and sisters here to do so, I do myself, O oh God. I lay myself upon the rock like the eagle I spoke of last night. O oh God, with every prayer that I'll have, beat everything ungodly away from me, Lord. I pray that you'll mold me until you, I, I can reflect your life. Grant it, Lord. Help me to be true and honest. Help me to always be strong and brave. Help me, Father, to carry the word to the unmissionary lands of the world. Grant it, Father. Bless this businessman association. May it live and may it prosper and go on and see the coming of the Lord and get many souls ready. Man of honor, man of integrity, man that's great man who spend their own living, take off their time to bring the gospel. Support ministers to come in and spread the word. God, we love them, and we pray that they'll be mighty in the land and used in your hands. Bless every minister, chair. Bless our brother Brown, our brother Duplicis, and all the other brothers, brother Joseph Bose, and all the others, the businessmen, and all together, Lord, and every sister. Bless their hearts, Father. We pray that you'll be with them and forgive all of our sins, and we consecrate ourselves to you now as your children. From this day on, may we live different lives. We ask it in Jesus' name as we present ourselves in your hands. Do with us as you see fit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated now for a, just a moment. I love him. Don't you love him? You feel better now? Don't the word just give you a scouring out and just uh, makes you feel all refreshed and everything? It's wonderful. We love the Lord with all of our heart. Don't you love him? All right, now I'm going to turn the service to Brother Carlson here, I suppose, our brother chairman, and he will come and take the service now. If we should gather a year from the day, and I live, he's probably will not, I may not be living a year from the day. Jesus may come before it is. But if I happen to come back to another one of the conventions here, the regional convention of this great state, there'll be some of us missing. We are pretty sure of that. Our ages and the way things are going and the number of the chair. And if I never see you again until I meet you at the river, God bless you and be with you till the end. God bless you, Brother Carl. Shall we all stand? I feel that uh, Brother Clayton and a few others, Brother Brandon, would you come over here? And our brother from Minneapolis is just coming into the door. Would you kindly come up? Uh, you, brother. I feel that we should pray for Brother Branham. He's praying for everybody all the time. And let's us raise our hands. You'll raise your hand towards the platform here. Our brother, you will pray. Thank you, friend. Thank you, Father. I 
receive it, Lord. I know that you'll hear the prayer. Thank you, Jesus. I believe you. Help me. Hallelujah. Oh, God. May it be my parish. May I live for you. Dear bless you, Lord. I thank you for these noble people. I receive and believe their prayer. Amen. 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 And oh, we'll never forget this meeting, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. As we stand in thy press, Lord God, we pray that I will strengthen my brother, Lord Jesus. Oh, God, that I will fill him with thy press as we have felt tonight, Lord. That he may be a tool in thy hand, reaching many souls for thee, Lord. Hallelujah. Blessed be thy holy name. Blessed be thy holy name. Blessed be thy holy name. We thank thee, Lord, for this uh, night, for my brother, a brother, praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, my Christian brother, my Christian friends out there. I'll be depending on that. I'm going now into the fields, you know where I'm going. It's coming back, going, aim to meet our brother Bose in Africa right away to go down through Africa and uh, different parts of the world. I'll be remembering your all's blessings with me. I'm sure. Pray for me, and I'll continue to pray for you. God be with you. Thank you.